hey, you know about the three states that matter, right? Solid, liquid, and gas. Well, did you know there's a fourth state? It's called plasma, and it's more common than you might think. Today we're going to look at that, but first let's get chilly and look at some icy cold concoctions right here on Do Try, Don't Try, This at Home. So let's talk about the weather. Crazy, isn't it? Lots of people seem to be saying that lately. In early 2019, the entire Midwestern United States experienced one of the biggest cold snaps it's seen in a very long time. Temperatures fell so low that frostbite would take hold in under a minute of exposure to the outside air. Cold can make a lot of weird things happen. It can make trees explode. It can vaporize hot water immediately. And it can make ice. Wait a minute, what's so weird about ice? Well, let me tell you. You remember the three states of matter I mentioned earlier? One way that you can look at those is how much energy is stored in that matter. All matter is made up of atoms that are constantly moving around at different speeds. As they buzz around, they tend to bump into each other, transferring some of their energy to the other atoms around them. Naturally, over time, the energy from these atoms gets evenly distributed and everything sort of balances out. Uh, that is a free, that's a phenomenon that's called equilibrium. What I'm talking about here is what we know as temperature. The movement of atoms at, in an object determines how much heat an object possesses. As an object gains more energy, its atoms move faster and it gets hotter. When something hot sits in an area, it disperses its heat to the objects around it because its atoms are bumping into them and transferring their energy to the surrounding atoms. So what's this have to do with solids, liquids, and gases? Everything. Look at it this way. If you roll a marble into another marble, it'll knock it further away if, if it's going faster. The same is true for atoms. The faster they move, the more they push each other. As they push each other further away, the object they make as a whole becomes less dense, eventually going from a solid, then to a liquid, and then to a gas. As these Atoms of an object heat up and push each other away. It causes the object to expand in size. And this is where water gets weird. Ice. So what's weird about ice? Ice gets big. Water's the only liquid that will grow in size as it freezes into a solid. As water freezes, its molecules will arrange themselves in a crystal pattern, a bit like a honeycomb, creating more space between them. This makes it less dense, which causes it to float. So why does that matter? It does matter. It's absolutely crucial to the formation of life on Earth. Imagine a bunch of fish swimming around underwater. Now let's picture some ice forming on top of the water. As it is now, any ice that forms in the water will float to the surface, leaving the liquid water underneath for all the fish to swim around in. But if that wasn't the case, any ice that formed on the surface would sink down and trap anything in its path. Because scientists believe that all life began in water, this would have been very problematic for the first living things that wouldn't have been able to escape the ice that sank down to the bottom. Now let's try a little experiment. This is one you can try at home. I have here a uh, small common salt shaker. It's made out of glass and it's got some um, little holes in the top and it needs those holes because if it didn't have them, it wouldn't be a salt shaker, would it? Uh, if you're trying this at home, use a plastic container instead of a glass one. And don't use a container that your mom likes too much either. All we're going to do here is fill the shaker with some water and place it in the freezer. Easy enough to do. I got water. And it's full. And it's gonna to have to go in the freezer. Science is all about theories and hypotheses. 
Whenever you do an experiment like this, you start with an idea and then you come up with a way to test your idea. That's your experiment. My hypothesis here is that water expands when it freezes. The result I expect is that the water will force itself through the little holes in the top as it gets colder. So let's give it a chill and see what happens. Now, while we wait for that to freeze, let's take a look at something much, much colder. And don't try this one at home. Is dry ice. Freezer? Dry ice is carbon dioxide, the stuff we breathe out, in solid form. It freezes at around minus 109 degrees Fahrenheit and can cause frostbite in a matter of seconds. What it's doing here is known as sublimation, the transition from solid straight into gas. Under normal conditions, carbon dioxide is a colorless, odorless gas, but in this high of a concentration, it turns into a milky white smoke with a slightly acidic odor. In fact, in a high enough concentration, this CO2 gas can react with your eyes, nose, or mouth to create carbonic acid. A weak acid, but still a very unpleasant surprise for those that might have experienced it. A ghostly beauty that dances with an otherworldly cadence, seeming almost to sway to a music that human ears are deaf to. There's all kinds of weird properties that can be observed in substances this cold. Here we see it dancing across a pan, propelled along by the gases it releases as it sublimates. It works a bit like a hovercraft, floating on the thin layer of gas that is constantly escaping from its underside. When we try to stop this from happening, it simply starts to build up pressure until... The gases force their way through. When introduced to water, the sublimation accelerates, creating this boiling cauldron of iron ice. This is often used in fog machines to create a mist that rolls across the ground, eerily and slow. However, as it's exposed to the frigid material, sometimes a solid shell of ice forms around the outside of it, stopping the reaction and trapping the material inside. As the air around it slowly warms the water, pockets will form. These tiny pinholes allow the trapped gases to erupt out of them, forming freezing cold geysers of dense fog. Another way the gas can be captured is with soap. The gas will fill into bubbles, much like those that you may have blown in a distant summer memory. But if we spread the soap solution as a thin layer over the top, we get to see it well up into this little balloon and ever so slowly grow until... Slowly, over time, the temperature of this mixture, as with all things, will reach an equilibrium. As all things slowly interact with each other, this dry ice will dissipate back into a colorless, odorless carbon dioxide, leaving us right back where we started. Cool stuff, huh? We're going to have to wait a little on that salt shaker experiment. But while we do, let's talk about why we have to wait anyway. I mean, sure, you always have to wait for things to freeze. But what if you didn't have to wait for them to freeze? We already talked about the state of matter being linked to the motion of its atoms or molecules. So for freezers to work, they need to be full of some very cold air with the particles going very slowly so that they'll absorb the heat of the water that you put into it very well. But this also takes time. 
The next thing we're going to do is try to look at multiple ways of increasing or decreasing the amount of time that it takes for water to freeze. In this process, we have four factors that we can look at. The first and most obvious is that we could put it in a colder freezer. Obviously, if the air around it is colder, it's going to freeze faster. The second is that we can change the container that it's in. Different materials will transfer heat better or worse than others, so putting it in such containers should help this process. The third is, moving, is mixing other things in with it. The vast majority of water has other stuff mixed into it, so we can look at how that affects stuff also. And the fourth has to do with pressure. With all things, the point at which a change in state happens has two primary components that affect it. The first is temperature, like we mentioned before. The second is pressure. The more pressure is put on an object, the less its molecules are able to bounce around. Therefore, if we're able to put water, or anything else for that matter, into a high pressure environment, it would freeze much more easily. Conversely, if we put it in a low pressure environment, like a vacuum or at a high altitude, it would take longer to freeze. That leads to just one of the many weird things that happens out in space. Water simply boils away when exposed to a space environment. Now I assume most of you don't have any spare pressure chambers lying around at home to help you make ice cubes, huh? Uh, today we're going to look specifically at the two factors that you have the most control over, the container and the additives. The first thing we're going to do is just try a couple different materials to hold our water and see which one cools it quicker. We have four containers here. We have glass, we got plastic, metal, and a paper cup. We're going to fill each of them with the same amount of water, then throw them in the freezer and see which ones freeze faster. So here we go. paper cup, which is the weird one out of all of them. That looks about right. Now we'll get back to that in a little bit. Now let's look at making it harder to freeze. Living in a cold area means you probably know that salt helps melt ice, but have you ever wondered why? We mentioned earlier that water freezes into a crystal pattern. What salt does is makes it harder for the water to do that by just getting in the way of the chemical structure. Water normally freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. When it's mixed with salt, that temperature goes down. It does, however, need to have some liquid water to mix with. Luckily, most of the ice that forms on the ground does have a layer of liquid water on the outside, which helps the salt work its way in. With a 10% salt mixture added, That'll go down to 20 degrees. So here we've got a, just got a glass of plain old ice, nothing in it. And here we've got 10% salt mixture. Uh, with a 20% salt mixture added, it goes all the way down to four degrees Fahrenheit. So we add 20% to this one. I believe that's it. And there are other uh, compounds uh, besides salt that can lower the temperature even more. So I've got this uh, calcium chloride solution here. It's another ice melting uh, compound that's frequently used in people's uh, driveways and sidewalks. And we'll pour that right in here. As these sit, they'll all melt at different rates. And while that's happening, uh, we'll go ahead and jump on over to the complete opposite end of the temperature spectrum, plasma. As straightforward as the other states of matter. The other three states of matter are simply achieved by heating or cooling a substance until its properties change. I know I said earlier that an object's state is directly linked to its temperature, but plasma is a bit different. When it comes down to it, states of matter are defined by the way they behave. A solid object will maintain its shape while undisturbed. 
A liquid will take the shape of whatever container it's in and it maintains its size. Gas expands to fill whatever container it's in. And plasma, well, plasma can do all sorts of things. Try and put it simply, plasma is a substance that acts as a sort of collective or it's a unified substance. Water molecules, on the other hand, will bump into each other and move about somewhat independently of each other. Particles in a plasma typically will all be held precisely by each other. A single force acts upon them all in the same way. And they're often highly electromagnetically charged and can be drawn to other strong electromagnetic fields, like those that are produced by radio wave transmitters. Right, that's a lot of words, um, but uh, really, just what is plasma? Uh, what it is, is it's a substance that's more common than you might think. Plasma was first discovered in 1879 by Sir William Crookes, who wasn't really a crook at all. At the time, he called it radiant matter, uh, which he generated inside of a glass tube by using electricity. It wouldn't come to have its modern definition until 1928, when Irving Langmuir and his colleagues coined the term plasma, likening it to the blood plasma. At the time, it was thought to be a rare and difficult to produce substance, but now we know just how common it is. Plasma is found almost everywhere, lots of places. Uh, really, 99% of matter in the universe is thought to be plasma because every single star is made out of plasma. And most of the known mass of the universe is due to the countless stars that we can see on any clear night. It's used in just about every form somewhere and in just about every industry. And today we're gonna to take a look at two forms of plasma. First thing we're gonna look at is the form of plasma you're probably most familiar with. Electrical arcs. A common example of a very powerful electrical arc is a bolt of lightning. Since we can't really make lightning without the ability to control the weather, we're gonna to have to fire up something called the Jacob's Ladder. A Jacob's Ladder is more commonly known, or formerly known, uh, as a high voltage traveling arc. And it's a device designed to create a spark gap that sends electrical arcs up its length in a continuous series. It's named after the ladder of heaven that's uh, described in the Bible. And even though it isn't quite a bolt of lightning, it can still generate an impressive little show. Well, let's take a look at it. Now it needs electricity to operate and that's about it. You know what's interesting? The paths of these arcs are decided by the arc molecule, the air molecules around them. They're all, they always choose the path of least resistance. That means if we were to put this in a vacuum chamber, it would start making soft little waves of plasma instead of these intricate electrical arcs. Pretty neat. Okay, now we can demonstrate another way to observe plasma besides the Jacob's Ladder. Uh, for this one, we're gonna need a beaker, a flame source, like a glass beaker, and a microwave oven. All we're gonna do here is microwave the flame in a clear container. Um, that can hold it. If you wanna try this at home, make sure you have parental guidance as needed, uh, because we all know that fire can be pretty hazardous. Uh, you'll also wanna make certain that you have a genuine borosilicate glass beaker with a pouring spout. The common name for uh, borosilicate glass is Pyrex. It's very good for high temperature uses. Uh, this Pyrex beaker will contain the plasma without shattering and it'll allow the air to fuel the flame inside. Uh, so now that we've got the materials that we, got, uh, that we need, let's, uh, let's give it a shot. Um, oh, and by the way, um, probably a good idea to have some really heavy uh, leather gloves or heat resistant gloves because uh, this beaker will get hot. flame source and we got a flame and we got a beaker 
So let's try this. And we start the microwave oven. Oh, unfortunately, unfortunately, we just lost our flame. That's what I'm talking about. Pretty impressive for a little match. Science can be pretty cool, huh? Sometimes it even works. <laughs> now that we've safely taken care of uh, any of these fire issues by making sure that it's out, uh, let's get back to the ice experiments. Um, so uh, here we, uh, so we're going to just wait a little bit until we get the uh, get our ice back from our uh, from where it's at, and in that time, probably a good idea to move some of our equipment out of the way. Probably won't need these anymore. Okay, folks. Okay, my lab assistants are bringing the, they're bringing the, the water experiment over here. Okay. We've got our, we've got our thermometer. We've got our four, uh, we've got our four, uh, uh, we've got our four cups with the salt experiment in. And we're going to see if we can take a temperature reading on these guys and see what we get. Okay. We have. Okay. Um, first, we're going to take a look at our heat transfer cups over here. Um, we've got the glass. transfer. Now these aren't quite frozen. These have just been in the freezer for a short amount of time. I've got 53 degrees in the glass. I've got 58 degrees in the plastic. This should be the lowest one. This is the metal one. That's 49. Yep. So that's that's the fastest heat transfer that we've got right here. The the metal actually goes and cools down the liquid, the, the water that we've got uh, the most of any of these two of these uh, devices that we've got. Okay. Let me get this out of the way. So what we've got here, we've got our control cup right here with the ice in it, and the cubes have not melted whatsoever. They're just kind of, I don't even see, they don't even look wet. Um, the 10% ice solution that we've got, right, or the water uh, salt solution that we've got, the ice is about halfway gone. And the 20% solution that we've got here, 
uh, should melt the ice even faster, and it is. There's, uh, there's less ice in this than there is in our 10% solution, about half of it. And then the calcium chloride, which does the best job of all, the, there's basically hardly any ice cubes in it, uh, hardly any volume there to those ice cubes at all. So it looks like what we predicted to have happen, happened. All right. Um, so anyway, moving along, um, uh, let's, uh, oh, that's, <laughs> I almost forgot about our salt shaker. Okay, so uh, anyway, so we've got our salt shaker here, which uh, reminds me that we have to take a look at the salt shaker that's frozen. Should be over here. Oh my gosh. All right. Now this is why you don't want to go and take any of your mom's really good household items and use them for experiments because as you can see the glass shattered due to the expansion of the ice in the salt shaker. The water in the metal cap turned to ice. Plug the holes so that the rest of the water in the shaker could not escape. The trapped water expanded when it changed into ice. The glass bottle couldn't expand with it and uh, so it didn't just crack, it kind of shattered. Well, unfortunate. I guess we need a new salt shaker. Maybe we'll just use this one instead. I guess that just goes to show you that even when you think you uh, understand principles of science, uh, it could still surprise you. And that's sort of the point. Science isn't about proving someone right or proving someone wrong to make them feel good or bad about things. Science exists so we can gain a better understanding of what's true and real in the universe so we can all make better decisions and live better lives because of it. Um, a lot of the best science has occurred when someone tried to make one thing happen and something completely different and unexpected came about. That's what makes it exciting, seeing the interesting, amazing, and sometimes even kind of crazy things that happen when you least expect them. Now, I hope you may have learned something. I did. Uh, maybe you uh, might even want to try doing some experimenting yourself. I've been your host, um, the one, the only, not a magician, just a technician, Mr. Webbs. I'll see you guys around and maybe next time we'll blow something up together, but only if we can do it safely. <laughs> <laughs>